welcome back. Um, I gather, un unfortunately, I didn't see all of this morning's sessions, but I gather that they were interesting. Um, I have a really bossy boots approach to um, moderating things. I make the speakers stick to their 15 or 17 minutes allocated time, and I'm not going to switch from that this afternoon. Um, mainly because I think a lot of these conferences are most beneficial when you get to the question and answer stage. And so I'm hoping that there will be enthusiastic questions, awkward, difficult questions, uh, put not to me because I'm only <laughs> moderating, um, but to my three colleagues here who are going to speak during this session. And this session is called The Copyright Liability of Online <coughs> Content Platforms and Social Networks. And I'm moderating it. This is what I call a title that's utter gobbledygook to most people. Um, and I have always hated the word platforms the same way as I hate a large number of other words like fiscal space. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but nevertheless, we have three very, very learned people coming to talk to us about these things about which they probably, or each of them probably, knows a lot more than I do about these platforms because I've really become too old for this kind of stuff. Um, so they each have 15, 17 minutes and we're starting off with a fascinating topic, at least fascinating to me, called from Professor O'Dell. I don't read out how wonderful all of these people are because you've got all their information on this and I assume that you've got to the stage where you can read, um, <clears throat> but you'll see what it says about him, and he's very eminent. And he's going to talk about proportionality, rights, and injunctions against intermediaries, all fine. Why enforcement needs a total perspective vortex. And I thought, what does that mean? <laughs> and the thing that struck me immediately from my background as a practicing barrister, and I'm sure it applies to all solicitors, that the thing I most associate with a vortex is when you send out a fee note to a client, <laughs> and it finds the vortex of its current fiscal space, <laughs> which means that you never actually get to see the money that was supposed to come out, because something incredible has happened to it on the way. But I did remember coming across this uh, total perspective vortex somewhere in my youth and I was trying to work out where and I went online and I discovered it's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy so that would give you an idea of what we're in, what's in store for us but I thought you might like to hear a little bit about it. This fellow, this fellow, it's described very very briefly in the following terms and maybe Professor O'Dell was going to tell you about it but this chap decided that he would, because he was a thinker about all sorts of things, including paper clips, so that'll give you an idea. Um, and his wife was driven demented by this rather weird kind of intellect that he had. So she said, would you just have some sense of proportion? Sometimes she'd say this as often as 38 times a day. So he built the total perspective vortex just to show her. And into one end, he plugged the whole of reality as extrapolated from a piece of fairy cake. And into the other end, he plugged his wife. So that when he turned it on, she saw in one instant the whole infinity of creation and herself in relation to it. To Trin Tragula's horror, because he was the guy who actually set it up, the shock completely annihilated her brain. But to his satisfaction, he realised that he had proved conclusively that if life is going to exist in a universe of this size, then the one thing it cannot afford to have is a sense of proportion. <laughs> there I leave you to hear all about proportionality, a mystifying concept in my opinion. So here we are. Judge, thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, I'm going, my talk is divided into four parts. And if we think about a restriction, uh, let's say it's a restriction on speech like censorship, as a restriction on freedom of expression, then we know that rights when they're res restricted need to have a good justification, let's say a public order justification, uh, and the justification has to be sufficient to justify uh, the restriction in question. It can't go too far, it has to be proportionate, you can't take a sledgehammer to crack a nut. So those are my fourth, the, the four parts of, of my talk. I'm going to talk about restrictions on intermediaries, 
uh, the rights that are engaged by these restrictions, the reasons why we have these restrictions, and the proportionality review of these restrictions. So four R's. And the first R is restrictions. And I'm primarily talking about restrictions on internet service providers, and these are the members of the Internet Service Providers Association of Ireland, and two of them in particular have been on the receiving end of a lot of the cases that I'm going to talk about today. Those two, Air and Virgin, in their prior existences as Aircom and UPC. Um, and just to be awkward, I want to uh, signal that I will be coming back to the Hungarian uh, Internet Service Providers Association, the MTE, in a little while. <coughs> so, restrictions. This is the village green in a little village in upstate uh, New York called Norwich. Mm -hmm. And this is the Norwich of Norwich Pharmaca, which is something I didn't realize as an undergraduate when I first read the case. The case in which um, a plaintiff can get information from a defendant um, uh, that is uh, important in the context of litigation being taken by the plaintiff. And in these circumstances, um, the Irish High Court has a, allowed several times, and this is the first EMI versus Aircom, um, Norwich Pharmacal orders uh, by rights holders against intermediaries to identify infringers. <clears throat> so that's the first species of restriction. None of this is going to be news to anybody. The second species of restriction is a blocking injunction. Lots of blocks there, hit a brick wall, it's an injunction. Um, <coughs> and uh, blocking injunctions have been given to block, um, to get uh, ISPs, uh, to block access to infringing um, websites uh, that, that are uh, infringing the rights holders' content. And the most famous of these is Pirate Bay, and Pirate Bay has been losing uh, and sinking as a consequence um, in, in the case of a lot of uh, blocking injunctions cases. Um, right, we're not really going to play question and answer because of the, um, the, the, the volume in the room. So I, wasn't, I was going to ask you, what is this? And somebody would eventually recognize that this is something called whack-a-mole. Um, and that's effectively what um, blocking injunctions, especially against Pirate Bay, tend to be because the site goes down and it comes back up a little while later and then another injunction and it goes back down and comes back a little while later. Uh, and the third species of injunction is uh, graduated response or three strikes. Three strikes being a baseball term, like a whack-a-mole, an American idea. And I've always wondered about the idea that if you miss something, it's called a strike. But anyway, that's just an American misuse of the English language. Um, and uh, uh, in the case of a three strikes injunction, uh, in the case of peer-to-peer -peer sharing, okay, I'm sorry. Um, um, in Sony versus UPC, um, Mr. Justice Cregan gave a, uh, awarded an injunction that allowed um, a three strikes regime uh, to be enforced by rights holders, in this case Sony and, and others, against an ISP, in this case UPC. Um, and the legal basis for these injunctions is now clearly um, Section 45A of the 2000 Act as amended. Um, there was uh, some uh, discussion about the legal basis, um, but all of those issues have been removed <coughs> by uh, the SI that inserted that section. So there is a clear legal basis for these restrictions. Um, so what are the rights that are infringed by these restrictions? And this is a, uh, um, a, an artwork uh, done by students in the School of Essex Human Rights course. Uh, they put the uh, rights of the uh, Universal Declaration <coughs> in different languages on the steps leading up to the school. Uh, so what are the rights that are infringed? Well, uh, in the first place, um, a whole range of rights of the ISPs, obviously because these are the defendants, are potentially uh, being infringed. Uh, uh, European Union right to conduct a business, uh, European Union right to provide services, freedom to provide services, and um, in, in the Irish context, uh, also the potential infringement of the constitutional right to communicate. Um, and if we think about our three kinds of restrictions, uh, we can see that not only are they potentially infringing on rights of the ISPs, but they potentially infringe on lots of other rights as well. 
So if we think about our um, Norwich Pharmacal order, uh, it is plainly capable of infringing on the rights of ISPs customers to privacy, and there's a whole range of sources of these rights to privacy. Uh, blocking injunctions likewise potentially infringe on the rights of ISPs customers to access information under the European, uh, under the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, uh, the right to communicate under the Irish Constitution, the right of access to the internet, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression has suggested that various bodies of rights are heading in that direction. Uh, and the rights of third parties can be infringed by blocking injunctions, their rights of expression and communication in an Irish context, as well as under the European uh, uh, Convention on Human Rights, I'll mention Ashby Donald again in a moment, and again under Article 11 of the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And then the rights of blocked sites, their rights, their rights, their freedom to provide services, um, are being infringed, or potentially at least being infringed, uh, by the injunctions. So Spoken Grogan is a case in which an injunction granted in an Irish High Court um, to prevent information um, uh, being distributed by a service provider in the UK was held potentially able to infringe the uh, predecessor of Article 56, although the court in that case held that the uh, restriction was proportionate. But the point is that it did potentially prima facie infringe uh, Article 56. And three strikes injunctions also have an impact on the rights of ISPs, the same uh, ISP customers, the same sets of rights as we've already seen, um, and uh, uh, the expression and communication rights again. Now, I'm not saying that all of these injunctions will infringe all of these rights every time. <coughs> but what I am saying is that there's a whole range of injunctions and a whole range, a whole range of rights. Um, and in any given case, a, an individual injunction will at least implicate some of these rights. Um, and if we apply my, well, right restriction, um, restriction on a right, what is the reason for it? Well, in all of these cases, the main reason uh, will be the IP rights of the copyright rights holder, um, which have um, strong status in the Court of Justice under the... Um, uh, copyright directives, InfoPAC, which um, Linda was talking about and ACI Adam uh, talk strongly about these rights. Similarly recognised in the <coughs> Court of Human Rights, um, IP rights are um, located in Article 1, Protocol 1, and copyright as an aspect of IP rights is protected by Article 1, Protocol 1 of the Convention. And similarly, there is a lot of Irish case law that says that um, IP rights are property rights for the purposes of the Irish Constitution. So that's a strong basis to justify the restrictions on the rights. But there still has to be a standard of review or scrutiny. And this is my favourite reviewer. His name is Anton Ego, uh, and he is a character in one of the best movies of the last century, Ratatouille. Um, the fact that it didn't win an Oscar, to my mind, is uh, you know, disgraceful. It should have won Best Picture, not, not even just Best Animated Picture. Uh, so, um, standard of review. Um, and one of the important trends in the Court of Justice, and this is almost an answer to a question that Linda asked in the first stage, she said, are there cases in which the Court has said um, the exceptions have to be seen in terms of uh, individual rights. Not yet, but they're getting there. They're saying that there has to be a balance between the rights of rights holders and the, uh, the rights of others, uh, both in Pramusakai and in uh, UPC. Uh, the, the court has said that you need to get a balance in these circumstances between the rights holders and the users. <coughs> Uh, and in Ashby Donald versus France, a case involving uh, copyright infringement of photographs during Paris Fashion Week, uh, the Court of Human Rights has held that uh, uh, copyright rules can, in principle, uh, be infringements upon uh, Article 10 rights uh, unless they are proportionate. So again, we are back to the need for proportionality, the idea that uh, as you don't take a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Um, and we do see in some of these cases, some of the ISP cases, some of the injunctions cases, that the courts do talk about ensuring 
that the um, orders that are being given, whether it's an Orange Pharmacal order, whether it's a blocking injunction, whether it's a three strikes injunction, are in fact proportionate. And perhaps the best discussion of proportionality in this context, well, actually, um, does anybody recognize this uh, not particularly uh, prepossessing uh, cottage? It happens to be uh, in the Bahamas. It is the house in which um, uh, Ian Fleming wrote the um, James Bond novels. It's called Goldeneye, which is where the title of the book and the movie came from. Uh, and the uh, Goldeneye judgment, it's an Orange Pharmacal application, is the first time that there is a serious analysis of the proportionality of the uh, injunction being sought um, as it affects the rights not just of the uh, defendant against whom the order is being sought, but also the third parties about whom the order is being sought. Um, and similarly, in the context of a blocking injunction against Pirate Bay, uh, the same analysis is undertaking, undertaken in Dramatico and B Sky B. Um, referring to, and I will come back to this, the Newsbin case. Um, Mr. Justice Arnold in the Cartier case simply read this analysis across. He said if um, uh, the injunctions in these previous cases are proportionate, then if he has the uh, legal basis to order an injunction in the Cartier case in the context of trademark infringement, uh, it would be in, uh, proportionate too. Um, and then this is read back from the trademark context back to the copyright context um, in the popcorn time uh, 20th Century Fox and Sky case. Um, now, the most recent case on the issue of these kinds of injunctions in the Irish courts is the Sony and UPC, UPC case to which I have already referred. Very long judgment of Mr. Justice Cregan, very repetitive. He sets out the same sets of facts at least three times. Um, but not particularly analytical on the uh, legal issues. The, the case seems to have been fought largely on the facts, which is why uh, he stated them three times, I think. Uh, if something is worth saying, it's worth saying three times. If something is worth saying, it's worth, you see where I'm going. With this. Um, so, uh, but he does refer to proportionality in one paragraph, in two sentences, and all he does is he picks up on the decision in Newsbin, which is the oldest of the decisions I have mentioned, the first one in which proportionality is mentioned at all, and isn't significant on the facts because the infringement is so egregious that uh, the injunction would be, was straightforward. Um, so there isn't a whole lot of proportional, proportionality analysis in Newsbin, and it's the only proportionality case uh, to which Mr. Justice Cregan refers in Sony. Now, this is where we start to have to have a sense of proportion. This is what it looks like in the inside of the total perspective vortex. You are told that you're in an insignificant uh, spot just there, unless you're Zaphod Beeblebrox, the president of the universe who was in the equivalent of a, um, uh, a, uh, 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 a space that was created specially for him to protect him, uh, where he was the most important person in the universe. So when he was told to have a sense of, pers uh, have a sense of proportion, he discovered, uh, unlike anybody else who had ever been in it, that he really was the most important being in the universe. Um, and he ate the fairy cake. Um, I'm nearly there. So if we are to have a sense of proportion, proportions are different things in different contexts. This is naturally occurring proportions in shells. These, on the other hand, are man-made proportions in the construction of Christchurch Cathedral. And the proportion there is very different to the proportion there. Proportionality is not a monolith. Proportionality is something that arises in a whole range of contexts. In the context of uh, judicial review of administrative action, uh, as analyzed in the Supreme Court in Meadows, and in the Supreme Court of the uh, UK in FAM. It arises differently, and this is the important thing, uh, the Supreme <coughs> Court of the uh, UK says in Bank Malat, it arises differently on <coughs> when European Convention considerations are engaged and followed on this point in the Irish Supreme Court in Godsell. And it arises differently again 
when European Union considerations are engaged. Uh, during the summer this year, the UK Supreme Court stressed that all of these kinds of proportionality are different things. Uh, and in Ireland, we have to add to that the understanding of proportionality in Heaney versus Ireland in the Right to Silence case, a constitutional gloss on all of this, which the Supreme Court in uh, Ostrovsky has said uh, covers the idea of a legitimate objective, a good reason, a rational connection uh, between the reason and the, the, the right, that it, the right <coughs> is minimally impaired and there is an overall balance in the outcome. Now, one, one, minute. one minute. I'm very nearly there. These are uh, my last few slides. My point is this. We have a whole range of different kinds of injunctions. We have a whole range of different kinds of rights. We have a wide range of justifications for the infringements on the rights by the, um, uh, by the, by the injunctions, by the infringements. One size does not fit all. The fact that one kind of injunction is a proportionate infringement upon one kind of right in one set of circumstances does not mean that a different injunction infringing a different kind of right in a different set of circumstances must be proportionate as well. In fact, quite the contrary. The need to have a sense of proportion requires an individuated assessment in every case. Reading across from Newsbin to Dramatico to, to Cartier and back to Popcorn Time and saying, well, if in respect of this right and this infringement, it was proportionate, then it must be proportionate all, in all of the subsequent cases too, is to fail to conduct a proper proportionality analysis, is to fail to have a sense of proportion. Delphi is a bad decision of the Court of Human Rights. Uh, recently in the MTE case, the uh, Hungarian uh, Rights, uh, the Hungarian Asso uh, Internet Service Providers Association, um, the, the court said that uh, um, the, uh, the infringement in Article 10 in MTE was disproportionate, notwithstanding that a similar infringement in different circumstances in Delphi was proportionate. So the proportionality analysis took into account the differences in the facts. One size does not fit all. That's it. I'm about ready to, to finish. Um, what I wanted to say, for those of you who are um, still interested in the hitchhiker's point, not just thank you very much, but so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs>